There are two main characters who are found in Revelation 17. Who are they? The beast and the great harlot, right? The beast and the great harlot. And true or false, the harlot is riding on the beast. True. And uh, they have loyalties one to another, don't they? And um, we've been studying about both of these, the characteristics of both of these, and we are finally down to verse 14. And I believe that verse 14 is probably the key verse of the entire book of Revelation. Okay? Uh, at least it summarizes the book of Revelation. Notice what it says. And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Man, that summarizes the book of Revelation, does it not? These shall make war with the Lamb. Uh, the these has to do with the beast... It has to do with the ten horns, who he said are the what? Anybody remember? Nobody remembers? The ten provinces of Rome that united together. Uh, they had uh, rulers over each one of them. And uh, they would unite and they would uh, enlist individuals for war. Uh, they would tax the people and all those kind of things. These shall make war with the Lamb. I put this statement down. Notice the strong terminology. These shall make what? War. Guys, Satan does not think this is a chess match. Okay? When Satan looks at this spiritual battle that's going on, to him, he's not playing checkers with God. Okay? You see, sometimes I feel like we as Christians believe that we are just in a little game. Okay? And if you want to play, you can. And if you don't want to play, you don't have to. Well, that is not the way the beast views this. And these shall make what? War with the Lamb. That's strong terminology. Now here's what's interesting. It's a war that he will lose. Isn't that interesting? It's a war that he's going to lose and yet he fights it. And he will do anything and everything he possibly can to take as many people with him in that loss. That's his goal. He knows he's going to lose. He's not concerned about that. All he's concerned about is taking as many people with him as possible. Wow. All indications are in Scripture that Satan was once what? An angel, wasn't he? A created being. Uh, we're not given a lot of information. It, appeal, it appears that pride lifted him up, and because of that pride and his rebellion against God, he took many of the angelic hosts with him, and they were cast out of heaven, weren't they? And right now, this world is his domain, is it not? This world is his domain. He is the God of this world. Yes, sir. Uh, th there's only one answer that I can give you, okay? And this is my guess. This is my speculation, all right? Glenn asked, um, if those angels sinned and could be cast out, what's keeping them, the rest of the angels who are up there, from doing exactly the same thing? And here's my only... The Scripture doesn't give us an answer to that. So here's my guess. The rest of the angels... Learn their lesson. The rest of the angels learn their lesson. Have you ever seen someone do something and you learned your lesson from it? Oh, yes. You know, not me. 
I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. And you never do it. Even though you still have the ability to do it, you don't. That's the only answer I can give you. Okay, Jeannie? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I asked this question. Now, remember, he's a, he was an angel, and he rebelled against God, right? And so I started asking some questions. Why would he oppose a God of love? Why would he oppose his Creator? That's amazing to me, isn't it? Huh? Listen to this. Why would he develop a spirit that would eventually land him in torments? There was an occasion when Jesus came upon individuals possessed with demons. And the demons immediately recognized Jesus as the Son of God. Okay? In fact, they even referred to Him as that. And they asked Him a question, and here was the question. Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? You see, I know that Satan knows He's going to lose. And yet he still does what? He still fights the war, doesn't he? It's unreal. The text says this, And the Lamb shall overcome them. Not long ago, I did a lesson. In fact, it was our introductory lesson for this year. And the title of it was... Yeah, see, it's only been a month, guys. Okay? And you say, yeah, I know, but it wasn't yesterday. Okay? The battle belongs. Oh, I just knew you'd finish it. You don't even remember. The battle belongs to who? To the Lord. That's a song that we sing sometimes. And the Lamb shall overcome them. The battle belongs to who? To the Lord. Why? Because he sits in the seat of ultimate power and ultimate authority, does he not? He is Lord of what? All lords. He is Lord of lords. And he is what? The king of all kings. There is no higher being than who? Than the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28, verse 18. Listen to Colossians 1, verse 18. And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. There's only one being, who is over Jesus Christ. And that's who? God the Father. He is the only being who is over the Christ. Now note this next point. As this war is being fought, there are some people who are on the Lord's side. Right? Right? There are some individuals who are on the side of victory. And they are described with three words, aren't they? And they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. We only use one of those words 
most of the time to describe God's people, don't we? Which one is it? And I said, how do we know that? Because it's the one we always use, preacher. That's what you just said. Isn't it funny? We don't refer to ourselves as what? The called. And we don't refer to ourselves as the chosen. Why not? Because those are Calvinistic words. Those are words used by the Presbyterians. And we don't use those words in the church, even though they're Bible words. Just like we don't call our elders bishops, and yet the Bible does several times. Oh, we don't say that. Don't say that, bishop. I'm not a bishop. I'm an elder. No, you're a bishop. There's six words I can call you, and they're all Bible. You know that? Ah, it drives me crazy. We don't talk about our priesthood. Right? Do we have a priesthood in the church of Christ? Oh, no, we don't have a priesthood. Yes, we do. It's, it's amazing to me. What you and I need to be doing is you and I need to be out here talking about all this stuff that we have in the church. I have been what? Called. I am one of the called. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. Who's got it? Every human being on the face of the earth is being called, are they not? Okay, and how are they called? It's not a miraculous call. It's not the Holy Spirit appearing to you. It's not, you know, seeing some message in the sky. It's not an angel standing at the edge of your bed. How are you called? By the gospel. We're into He called you by our gospel. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. Guess what Jesus is doing? He's calling. Isn't He? He's calling. Now, the only way you become the called is to do what? Is to answer the call. Okay? If you answer the call, then you become part of the called. And how do you answer the call? By being obedient to the gospel. And the very moment that you do that, not only are you called, but you are also chosen. Wow. Listen to this statement. The chosen of God are those who choose Him. Is that good? The chosen of God are those who choose Him. Man. Did God choose particular individuals to salvation? No. God chose a certain group of people to be chosen, didn't He? Not individuals. Kevin? Jesus said in Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. But few are chosen. Why? They don't answer the call. Okay? The, only, the only people who are chosen are those who choose Him. Okay? Uh, God, God, has a, God has predestined individuals to salvation. And the Bible teaches the doctrine of predestination. Not the Calvinistic doctrine of predestination, but it does teach that we've been predestined. Here's what He predestined. Every human being, who is in Christ will be saved. Every human being who is out of Christ shall be what? Lost. That's what he predestined. What does it mean to be in Christ? I'm going I'm to make it simple. Okay, Just, it, if you are in Christ, you are in the church. Okay? What does it mean to be in Christ? I'm in the church. The church, the church is the called out ones. The church is also the body of Christ. Wow. 
Okay? So, I, and, Jesus, and God said this, I'm going to predestine everyone who is in the church to be what? To be saved. And everybody who is outside of the church is going to be lost. I want you to listen to this, because this is what the world believes. The church is not important. Isn't that unbelievable? Acts 2.47 Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The saved are where? In the church. Acts 20 verse 28 says what? Yep. Turn there and read it. Acts 20 verse 28. Those first two words are called take heed. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over to which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to be the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. You hear that? Jesus purchased the church with what? His own blood. But the church is not important. Well, if the church is not important, then guess what? The blood is not important. Because he used that blood to purchase the church. I know how valuable something is by its what? By its purchase price. There is nothing more valuable on this earth than the church. How do I know? Because it was purchased by the divine blood of Jesus Christ. That's how I know. Man. Somebody read Ephesians 5 verse 23. He is the Savior of the what? The body. According to Colossians 1.18, the body is the church. He is the Savior of the church. Has God predestined a group of people to be saved? Yes. Who? The church. The called out ones. The ones who choose God. Will He force you to make that choice? No, He will not. He will not force you to make that choice. Man. Lastly, we are called, we are chosen, and we are what? Faithful. Folks, listen to me. This is something we got somehow, and I don't know how to do this. We have got to get it across to all Christians that we must be what? Faithful. And, and, and we've got to broaden our definition of faithfulness, don't we? I've talked about this many times. If you do two things in the churches of Christ, you're faithful according to our standards today. Okay? Numero uno. Attend about once a month. Okay? And when you come, drop a little bit of cash into the plate. And I don't even have to know whether you do it or not. But please just do it. Now, if you do those two things, guess what will never happen to you? You will never be rebuked. You will never be withdrawn from. And when you die, you'll be preached to heaven. Right? Oh, he's a good man. I remember down there at Oceanside and he attended about once every six weeks or eight weeks. And he threw in about five bucks in the plate. And we make people think that they're faithful. Right? That, so that must be the standard of faithfulness. Wow. I put down this. Hey, who's talking? Yes and no. I, I, I'm not kidding at all from the standpoint of this is what we do. Right? 
We're withdrawing from Brother Joe because he only attends once every six weeks. Now what we hope is, oh, well, at least he comes every now and then and maybe every now and then he'll get faithful. He'll hear something out of those ten times he comes to church a year. Oh, come on, man. What if he dies between now and then? And see, that's the question that I always ask. If, if a person lives like that, and he dies, what's going to happen to him? Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found what? Faithful. Faithful. If you showed up to your job one day a week, would your employer think you're faithful? Are you kidding me? If you had, a, if you had to attend a class at college and you show up once a month for that class, are you faithful? I used, I, I used to teach at a little junior college, and guess which group was the worst to attend? No, they were good. You could depend on them. Sports people. The sports people, okay? They're the ones riding on a scholarship, right? They're the ones who are needed for the sports program. They're the talented ones. They're the ones bringing in the money to the university. And so, if they only came once every two weeks, three weeks, they just need to make it up. Okay? <laughs> Folks, I tell you what. We're not going to die and get before, stand before God and God's going to say, you know what, you go right over there and I'm going to give you a period of time to make it up. That ain't go, you, you ain't going to make it up. I wrote down three things. Faithfulness involves, number one, love for God and not a love of the world. 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Number two, you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. You want to know the best way to define first? Have a potluck and tell someone you're first. He will not misunderstand. And you say, how do you know that, preacher? Because I am a preacher. And I go to gospel meetings. And they have a potluck. And guess what they tell me? Visiting preacher gets to go first. I know what that means. And I look at that little kid and I say, get back here. Preacher goes first. <laughs> now, now, Mike, I'm kidding. Okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> But we, isn't it funny how we understand what first means in everything except religion? Wow. How about this one? Obedience to the will of Christ. He is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? Obey Him. Love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Seek Him first and obey Him in all things. Folks, if you do that, will you be faithful? In fact, if you just practice the first commandment, right? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you just do that one, you'd be saved, wouldn't you? Faithfulness. Yes, sir. Could we say that faithfulness is a habit? Uh, in, contra in, in, in distinction to what? Well, if you are doing something by habit, you're going to do it regardless. And if you're faithful, come Sunday, you don't have to get up and say, well, am I going to go today or not? I mean, you, you, it's, it's already decided. I think faithfulness becomes... <laughs> well, I can't say that totally because so many... People who used to be faithful become unfaithful. Um, but I think if, if you, it, become, it, it can become a habit to you. It should become a habit to you, right? But you take a new convert 
Okay? They just obeyed the gospel. Are they required to be faithful? Yes, but it's not yet become a what? A habit. It is something that you have to teach them and you have to encourage them to do, right? Um, you shouldn't have to. You, at least you, you would think you shouldn't have to. Okay? But we do, don't we? And do we... Are there people who have been Christians 10 years, 15, 20 years, 25 years that we're still having to try to get to be faithful? Oh, yeah. Uh, did you read last week's bulletin article? Did you read that? Some people say, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I read about the announcements. Um, that's the reason I put an article in there, folks, you know, to, for, to read the article, okay? Um, there are certain things that individuals need to develop within their minds that will help them to become faithful. One of my first points was the grandeur of God. If I truly understand the grandeur of God, He is the highest of the high, isn't He? He is Lord of lords, King of kings. He is the Almighty. If I understand the greatness of God, it ought to motivate me to be faithful to Him. Okay? Just think He loves me. He wants to be my Father. He wants to save me in the last day, doesn't He? He wants all that is good for me. Um, I'm a dad, three kids, and my kid calls me and wants something. Guess what? I do about whatever I can do to help them, right? If, if it's within my power and if it's something within reason, you know. And, and if I, as a wicked, sinful fleshly guy will do that for my children, what does a heavenly, spiritual, holy God of love do for His children? You see? And if, if I understand God and my relationship with Him, I ought to be faithful. Okay? Um, and, and I'm writing about, there's going to be another article this week about four more things that will help us in that situation. Wow. We've got to be faithful. That's all I know. Notice Revelation 17, 5. And he saith unto me, who's the he? Sometimes we forget. <laughs> who's showing John all these things? An angel, yes, an angel. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. In verse 1, the text says that the woman was sitting on what? Many waters. Many waters. Okay, and now he explains what that is. Have you ever seen a great multitude of people? Anywhere? Okay, especially if they're all standing on the ground. Okay, uh, go out and pull up some concerts and stuff where individuals, uh, they're, they're out in a field somewhere and, and they're just, you know, 5,000, 6,000 people that are there. Okay, and you stand up there and you see those individuals and they give a stage view. And here's something we oftentimes say. Look at that sea of people, right? Because the people seem to just go where? Just go to the horizon, don't we? Just like if we go down here to the beach and we stand on the beach and we look at the ocean and the water seems to do what? The water just seems to go all the way to the horizon, does it not? So he takes that picture and he says, that's like a what? That's like people. She's sitting on the sea, sea of waters. He says, those are many people and nations and tongues. Who was, somebody have a statement, question? All right, good stuff. The great whore had power over and influence upon many peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Now watch this next statement. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall what? Hate the whore. Man. And shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat of her flesh and burn her with fire. True or false? 
the ten horns are part of the beast. True. The beast has ten horns, right? Those ten horns are part of the beast. And now note what the text says. The ten horns do what? Hate the whore. Man. Listen to this. If the hearted is Rome and the beast is Rome, then the beast hates itself and destroys itself. That's silly. That's nonsense. Okay? Rome never hated Rome. The Roman Empire never hated the capital city of Rome. They'd be foolish to do that, would they not? I also wrote this. If the harlot is Rome and the beast is Satan, then we have Satan turning on himself, right? Because Rome is what? An agent of Satan, isn't it? Remember what Jesus said? If Satan what? Is divided against himself, his kingdom cannot what? Cannot stand. That text is found in Matthew 12, verse 26. Um, Satan will never oppose himself, folks. He'd be foolish to do that, would he not? But it's interesting that we have this beast, the horse riding on his back, and now all of a sudden, the beast what? Hates the harlot. And that little word hate is pretty strong, okay? Listen to this statement by Brother Wallace. This is solid proof that the harlot city is not Rome. Assuredly, the Roman kings did not hate the capital city of the Roman Empire, but they did hate Jerusalem and coordinated their efforts with the emperor to reduce it to the condition here described. This verse alone should help us to understand who this book is talking about. Okay? This is not just a dislike or revulsion. It is an intense, fearful hatred causing one to turn in fury on another. Man. It is reminiscence of God's fury poured out on Jerusalem when it is invaded by the Babylonian armies of old. you got to be kidding me. This class is over? Unbelievable. Notice that he's going to do four things to the harlot. I will make her what? Desolate. Desolate. That little word desolate means to lay waste, to ruin, to bring to desolation. In Matthew 23, 36 through 39, Jesus told the Jews, See, your house is left unto you what? Desolate. Jesus knew that the end of Judaism was coming, did he not? Your house is left unto you desolate. You've rejected me. You're going to put me on the cross of Calvary. And ultimately, that is going to lead to the total destruction of who? Judaism. Notice too, he says what? He will make her naked. Does anybody remember how the whore was dressed? Oh, yes. You... Larry says high fashion. Okay, that's the first time I've ever heard a man say that. Okay, <laughs> you know, um, but he knows. Um, I wonder if that's the influence of a wife or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, she is high fashioned, all right. She's dressed in scarlet, right? She has on gold and silver, but yet what? Now she's going to be what? Naked, man. Total disrobing of this individual. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. That was the statement made in Isaiah 47, 3, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem of old. Uh, when a nation was totally defeated, totally annihilated, it was brought to total shame, just like an individual who, if he's uncovered, and paraded naked through the streets, he would be paraded in shame, would he not? Notice point number three. The beast shall what? 
eat her flesh. Wow. Remember the heart is dealing with a beast. Right? Uh-huh. And what do beasts like to eat? Flesh. So he takes the picture of the beast and uses it to describe the destruction of this beast destroying another animal, eating the flesh. And that's what uh, Rome is going to do to Jerusalem. Another individual made this statement. Oftentimes, after an enemy army has paraded through the streets and killed individuals, guess what they do with the dead? They just leave them. Food for who? Feed for the beasts, right? They come and eat their flesh. You remember old Jezebel? Yeah, old Jezebel. Wasn't much left of her, was it? You know? Falls out of that window, goes splat on the ground. Horse trompers her to death. Prophet goes inside and eats. Comes back out. Hands and feet. Dog done ate her up. Hmm. She put on makeup. She must have looked good. Must have been a good looking meal. Okay. Hey. Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Didn't they surround the city and starve them to death to the point that they ate human flesh? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was it was a horrible experience. It sure was. Uh, very much so. And then lastly it says burned with fire. Fire completely consumes what is burnt. Doesn't it? Brother West makes this statement. This is a picture of being finally, tragically, and completely left in ashes. What did Jesus say? There shall not be one stone left, what? On top of another. Jerusalem was going to be totally destroyed. The Roman armies that marched against the uh, city of Jerusalem are referred to by Jesus in Matthew 24 as the abomination of desolation. The abomination is coming. Man. And what are they going to do? They're going to leave Jerusalem totally desolate. Now, you've got some study to do. And you say, why? And I know you'll forget by you, time you get home. Listen to this. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill His will and to agree and give their kingdom to the beast unto the words of God, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Listen to that first statement. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill His will. Man. Y'all need to explain that to me. You know what? God put this into the hearts of who? Into the hearts of Rome. To do what? To destroy the city of Jerusalem. See, we don't have enough time to talk about that. Well, we do if you want to stay for a while. And I got it right here in my notes. I only got one more page. We are supposed to be finished. But we didn't. We'll talk about that one in the next verse very quickly next time and get into chapter 18. Start reading the next chapter. It's good. Thank you.